We are going to make your brains more beautiful. How are we gonna do that? With books, my friends, beautiful, beautiful books. Look, you know, as well as I do, that our minds, we are what we eat. Our minds are filled with the content we consume. Do you ever spend too much time doom scrolling on the apps? I have to watch out for that. We have these terms like rage farming. There are people out here on social media farming your rage like a resource, making you angry for money. So what if, instead of all the anxiety provoking data tracking software we're all addicted to, what if instead we tried to be a bit more intentional about the stuff we put in our minds and we filled our brains with beautiful art? I'm gonna take you through five books, several of which I can almost guarantee you've never heard of before, and every book on this list is beautiful. And this video is going to be filled with beautiful paragraphs beautiful lines taken from beautiful books. So even by watching this, if you stick around at the end, your, your brain is gonna be filled with a bit more beauty. Now you are watching me. This is like a subtraction, a subtraction of beauty, but the books, the books are beautiful. The books are very nice. Should say, some of them are sad, some of them are very sad, but they're beautiful. I find sad things beautiful. Is that, do you? First book we're gonna talk about is this novel, All is Forgotten, Nothing is Lost by Lan Samantha Chang. I just recently read this book, like finished it last week. And I don't know, I, I sort of devoured this novel. It's a novel about poets falling in love with each other. So it's, it's gonna be beautiful. It's all about art and love. A lot of poets discussing not just their processes, not just like how they make poetry, but also why, why you make poetry, and why a person would commit themselves, commit their, their whole lives to the, the risky proposition of being a professional poet. He bent his will upon the poems. It was hard work. He had never felt so humbled by words. He had never dreaded words as much as he did in those weeks. Words stalked him. Words ambushed his mind in the middle of the night. Words jumped out of newspapers and theater marquees and other people's poems. Still, he worked. So our protagonist in this novel is this guy named Roman. This young guy, he's this, this ambitious young poet. He's kind of a jerk, really. And he falls in love with this older woman who's his mentor, a very successful poet named Miranda. And it's all, it's kind of this cliche, sort of melodramatic romance, but... The thing is, that makes it kind of compelling, I think, is the two of them, what they have in common is the shared commitment to excellence in art. And it makes their relationship kind of weird and pathological and almost self-destructive. And really, I think what it's about is beauty. And what is, and potentially, what is the cost? What is the cost of committing yourself, devoting yourself to making beautiful art? Chang's novel is kind of sad. It's not like rip your heart out sad, but you know. Next up is not a novel. It's this beautiful little essay that I love and I teach very often. It's this this book on beauty and being just by Elaine Scarry. Scarry's book is a very quick read and it's philosophical, but it's very stylish. It's a very, it's a very pleasant read. And Scarry's little book begins with this thesis, this very simple thesis about the power of beauty that lives rent-free in my head. I think about this all the time. Beauty brings copies of itself into being. It makes us draw it, take photographs of it, or describe it to other people. Sometimes it gives rise to exact replication and other times to resemblances, and still other times to things whose connection to the original site of inspiration is unrecognizable. So the idea here, and this, I think when I, when I first read this, this just kind of blew my mind. The idea is that when we encounter beauty in the world, we feel compelled to replicate it. So when you think, you think about seeing a beautiful view or a beautiful flower, you feel this itch to, to pull out your phone and take a picture of it. Or if you're, if you're inclined towards other kinds of art, you want to draw a picture of that thing. You want to sketch it, you want to paint it. Sometimes we see something beautiful and it makes us want to write a song about it or write a poem about it. We have this human response to beauty that when we see beautiful things, we want to reproduce those things. She goes on to make this argument that beauty is deeply connected to truth and our, our desire for the truth. The beautiful, almost without any effort of our own, acquaints us with the mental event of conviction. And so pleasurable a mental state is this, that ever afterwards one is willing to labor, struggle, wrestle with the world to locate enduring sources of conviction, to locate what is true, both in the account that assumes the existence of the immortal realm and in the account that assumes the non-existence of the immortal realm, beauty is a starting place for education. It's a fascinating little book, so if you're interested, if you are yourself an artist, or if you're interested in philosophy, it's a great read. Third book, and you know this one, 
Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. This is an extremely famous novel. It's a stream of consciousness novel. So Woolf does her best in this novel to represent, to reproduce the experience of human consciousness in language. So when you think about the way your thoughts move through your mind, it's it's sort of all a jumble. The sequence is crazy, right? The, the way you think about your to-do list, and then you have a memory of your mother, and then you think about a vacation you're going to go to, and then you think about your favorite vacation, and then you think about what you had for lunch, and then your best friend calls, and you're interrupted. That's what's going on in your head all the time. And that's what it's like to read Mrs. Dalloway. Quiet descended on her, calm, content as her needle, drawing the silk smoothly to its gentle paws, collected the green folds together and attached them, very lightly, to the belt. So on a summer's day, waves collect, overbalance and fall, collect and fall, and all the whole world seems to be saying, that is all, more and more ponderously, until even the heart in the body which lies in the sun on the beach says too, that is all. Fear no more, says the heart, fear no more, says the heart, committing its burden to some sea, which sighs collectively for all sorrows, and renews, begins, collects, lets fall, and the body alone listens to the passing bee, the wave breaking, the dog barking, far away barking and barking. The story of Mrs. Dalloway is seemingly very simple. It's primarily about this woman, Clarissa Dalloway, who's planning a party. She's a middle-aged woman planning a party. What Wolf wants to show us is that even though the actions of the novel are, are very ordinary, they're very simple, what she wants to do is investigate the expansiveness of the mind and the expansiveness of the mind of ordinary people. So even as we follow Clarissa, who by most standards is kind of an unimpressive person, as we go into her mind and, and see the way that she experiences the world, which is really the way that all of us experience the world, we get a sense of, of the majesty, really, of, of human consciousness. Now, this is, again, this is kind of a sad book in a lot of ways. One, one of the other major characters figures in this novel is this guy named Septimus Smith, who's a, a World War I veteran, and he suffers from shell shock, he suffers from PTSD, and his life is in shambles. So there are tragic elements to this book. I think a lot of the things I find beautiful are tragic. I think tragedy can be beautiful. So some of these books, they may break your heart. But here's the thing. Here's the thing about beautiful art that breaks your heart. I think we have this temptation sometimes to dedicate our time to to a certain kind of self-improvement that is about productivity. Like, you need to be productive. You need to be more productive. We need to accomplish more. And some of the time that's good, but maybe you don't need to be productive all the time. I actually think all these books sort of provide antidotes to that, that kind of rise and grind mindset. I think that's a common thread that connects them all. That maybe you should also enjoy your life and try to fill it with beautiful experiences. Speaking of beautiful experiences, you should read Richard Wagamese's One Story, One Song. This is a collection of, of essays and short stories. Wagamese is, is an Ojibwe writer, and he writes a lot in this collection about our human relationship to the natural world and the importance of, of trying to escape or reimagine our, our relationship to industrialization, to, to capitalist economies. This collection is filled with stories about baseball and marriage and dinner parties. There are stories about leadership and about responsibility. And at its core, I think this collection is all about community, what it means and what it takes to be a part of a community. His stories are filled with these beautiful images. There's this one that always stays with me about riding snowmobiles way out in, into the wilderness in the dead of winter. It was the dead of winter. The engines sounded harsh in the crisp air, and when we stopped to drink coffee, the abrupt drop-off into silence was eerie. Every movement we made was amplified. My parka sleeve rustled loudly as I drank. We were at the back end of an old trap line in real wilderness, and we had the feeling of being watched from the trees. The day was sunny and cloudless casting the trees into deep shadows. The lake glistened so brightly that we had to squint to see, even through the tinted masks of our helmets. I felt very small. This is this is what I'm saying. Like this, you want to fill your mind with beautiful art because it centers you and it connects you to something that is bigger than yourself. It, it look, it's mystical. I don't know how else to describe it. It just, humans have always described it that way, but it's a real thing. Okay, last book is Mercy Among the Children by David Adams Richards, and I don't have that book here. So I've got to go to my office to get it. 
Okay, before I go, Mercy Among the Children is an extraordinary novel by Canadian novelist David Adams Richards. I used to teach it pretty regularly. I haven't taught it in a few years. It's this sprawling family history. It covers multiple generations. It's set in this small town, Miramichi, New Brunswick, which is a working class town in Eastern Canada. It's close to four, it's close to 400 pages, so it's pretty hefty. It's not the kind of thing you're gonna read in a weekend, but it's beautiful and extraordinarily moving it's probably gonna make you cry. One of the truly memorable things about this book is, is one of its protagonists, this, this father, this man named Sidney. And Sidney, he's got no money, uh, he's not traditionally educated, but he is a voracious reader. And he studies philosophy and theology, and so he's not wealthy, he does not occupy a high status position in society, but he has dedicated his life to the pursuit of, of wisdom and goodness. But things don't go well for him. He's kind of the town scapegoat. Precisely because he's so good, people take advantage of him. And the novel is this deep reflection on the nature of justice and human suffering. Everything I recommend is, none of it is light. I never said it was gonna be light. I said it was gonna be beautiful. It was good, and it is beautiful. Beauty is sometimes heavy. Is it pleasant? Maybe. If like getting the soul ripped out of your chest and torn apart and put back together again is pleasant, I think it is. That's what you're after. That's what you want, isn't it? It's not the, not the, you don't want the feeds that just stress you out over nonsense. You want something that reaches into your soul, harrowing reflections on forgiveness and accountability and life. This book is that. Okay. Uh, let's see, it should be, should be right around here. And there are gaps. And I have, see, it's summer, so I have books everywhere. Sorry, I always have books everywhere. It's not, summer is no excuse. There's a very real chance that I came all the way to campus to find this book, and it's actually back at my house. I do not think this book is here. I don't, I do not see it. Here. Here. Yes. Yes. Okay, we found it. Mercy Among the Children by David Adams Richards. Here's the thing about this, this novel. One of its main characters, Sidney, is this father, and he is the just man who suffers injustice. So there's there's something of Job, there's something of Socrates here. He is the just man who suffers injustice. So throughout the novel, he he relentlessly, he turns the other cheek. He's able to turn the other cheek over and over again. And there's something heroic and admirable about it. But we also hear how this affects his son, who feels like like his father won't always stand up for what's right. At one point, Sidney is framed for sabotaging a bridge. And Sidney's son, this, this makes him crazy. Why, God, do you allow this to happen? He now said. I heard him faintly speak this line from my bed. It never bothered me, for I knew my father, and I knew he spoke like this. But if he ever got an answer from God or anyone else, he did not say so to me. When I talked to God, I did not ask why things happened. I accused him of what was happening. That was the essential difference between father and me. By the way, I, I've been posting these weekly videos. Lately, they've been they've been videos about books. I talk about books on my camera, you watch on your telephone. Anyway, I invite you to subscribe and follow along. It can be fun, you can learn some things. We're on our way to 10,000 subscribers. We currently have 9,443, not too shabby. So there you go, there are five books to fill your brain with beauty. If you want more reading recommendations, I advise you to check out this video over here. I will see you there and I will talk to you soon.